thousand songs. And it goes right in my pocket. Failure of the future has to be a nation that is agile, that is innovative, that is creative. In our best talent. Welcome to Future Square, the podcast all about innovation in the enterprise, brought to you and run by Collective Campus, an innovation hub based in Australia that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies, and tools to successfully explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. For more information, go to www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Today's guest is considered by many to be the godfather of Silicon Valley, and is often credited with spearheading the lean startup movement, which was popularized by his former pupils, Eric Ries' book of the same name. Steve Blank is one of the most prominent thought leaders in the world when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship. Over the last 35 years, Steve has been part of or co-founded eight Silicon Valley startups. These have run the gamut from semiconductors, video games, personal computers, and supercomputers. Steve currently teaches entrepreneurship at Berkeley, Columbia University, NYU, Stanford, and UCSF. In 2009, he was awarded the Stanford University Undergraduate Teaching Award in the Department of Management Science and Engineering. In 2011, the National Science Foundation adopted his Lean Launchpad class as the US standard for commercializing basic and applied research via the Innovation Corps. I wholeheartedly recommend checking out steveblank.com. His book, Four Steps to the Epiphany, and his step-by-step guide to building a new company, The Startup Owner's Manual. His work has been incredibly influential on me, and I simply cannot recommend it highly enough. So with that, it gives me much pleasure to introduce the one, the only, Steve Blank. Welcome to the show, Steve. Oh, thanks for having me. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, let me just say I'm a massive admirer of your work, and you know, absolutely humbled to have you on the show. Well, thank you. Um, so I know you spend your time often trekking from coast to coast in the States, um, doing work at a lot of the universities. If I'm going off your Twitter feed, uh, is it right to assume that you're currently back home in Northern California? I am. Fantastic. So I was fortunate enough to see you speak in, in Melbourne about a year ago. Yeah, yeah Australia was wonderful. It's, uh, it's always great to remember that innovation happens everywhere. Well, that's and, exactly uh, right. It's certainly happening in, in Melbourne and Sydney and all across Australia as well, uh, as well as in the U.S. and Silicon Valley. Definitely. Have you got any plans to be back in Melbourne anytime soon or Australia? I'm always looking for an excuse, but so far, no plan. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll see if we can tee up a speaking gig or, or something to that effect to get you down here again. It was really, really good to see you speak last year. Anyway, we, we better get down to it. Purpose of today's conversation, um, I guess many people know you for your work in the tech startup space, having developed the customer development methodology, which you know went on to become the lean startup as popularized by Eric Ries. However, you're doing a lot more work these days in the corporate innovation space. Um, you recently published a four-part blog series on, corporate, on the corporate innovation outpost with Evangelos Simudis, and I understand that both Evangelos and yourself are working on a book on the new model for corporate innovation. Yeah, eventually, uh, we hope to crack the code on, uh, on corporations and uh, innovation as well. I mean, obviously, companies have been thinking about innovations for as long as startups have. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but for corporations, it's uh, even more important now in the 20th, 21st century than it was in the 20th. You know, large corporations are being disrupted literally as we speak, um, mm-hmm. and, and all the reasons one could expect and some that we couldn't. I mean, globalization, the emergence of the Internet, the emergence of uh, uh, startups that are fueled by um, what seems to be companies uh, to companies on limited venture capital, mm-hmm. uh, the fact that um, the Internet changed transparency and pricing and branding, yeah. all these things um, have changed the nature of the corporation in a mm-hmm. way that, you know, that there was never a memo that announced it, but the life cycle of a corporation in the 20th century used to be about, on average, 60 years, and yeah. now in the 21st, about 20 years. Mm. And if you're a corporate executive, you're kind of going, what the heck just happened? And exactly. where's the textbook on how to deal with this? Yeah, well, it seems that the, the move, well, the earth is moving underneath the feet of many large uh, corporations, and I guess this, yeah, I can use this as a segue into the, the evolution of corporate R&D. You know, you've talked about uh, the evolution of corporate R&D going from a very ad hoc sort of process in the late 19th century to the early 20th century. Then we went on into uh, corporate R&D labs through to the early 90s and corporate venture capital, and more recently the advent of the innovation outpost. Um, 
Can you elaborate for our listeners um, what the Innovation Outpost is and why it's more important now than ever before? Sure, and I think you just traced a pretty good summary of at least the uh, you know corporate innovation efforts in the in the 20th century. You know, for the good chunk of the 20th century, it was uh, large corporations and in specific industries mm-hmm. were the domain experts. They owned all the key R&D folks. If you were Kodak, you owned world-class research and development. I mean, mm-hmm. basic research for film and chemistry and, and, and Ray DuPont, the same thing. Mm-hmm. If you were General Electric, you've got a great research facility. And then in the tech space, if you were IBM or Bell Labs, uh, that is our telecommunications infrastructure in the United States, you had world-class researchers mm. that you owned as a corporation. Yeah. W- what happened, though, in the U.S., which kind of changed this, um, and the finance people finally caught on, is in World War II, the United States started funding for the first time ever in our country massive infusions of, of federal money from our government mm-hmm. into universities for basic and applied science. And so for the first time, universities became a source of research and it took companies about you know 30 or 40 years to realize why are we spending on money on this if the government's spending money on this and mm. eventually for cost cutting activities their large corporations realized that no they didn't need to own basic science research the u.s government was funding most of it and so that kind of got jettisoned mm-hmm. along with unfortunately at least for the u.s manufacturing and other things is because China became a manufacturing powerhouse. But in the last uh, kind of 10 or 15 years, large corporations, though, realized that they did need it to have, have something more than, than basic science from universities. They needed to have essentially applied technology mm-hmm. that were appearing in startups faster and faster, mm. and that they needed to understand this kind of, what are startups working on? How are they applying this advanced technology? And where are they getting it from? Yeah. And um, and pretty quickly they realized they needed outposts. We call them innovation outposts mm-hmm. where innovation was occurring. And most companies, there's over 200 companies that have set up these innovation outposts in Silicon Valley. That mm. is kind of putting their fingers into the, um, you know, kind of the environment of asking what's going on here. Yeah. And so an innovation outpost is kind of a, corporations uh, sense and respond facility in a technology cluster that's of interest to them. That's yeah. a long way to say, yes, there are a lot of innovation <laughs> outposts out here. Yeah, exactly. And um, I mean, why is the traditional corporate sort of model not conducive to, to innovation? Why do large organizations need to set up an innovation outpost as opposed to your traditional R&D lab or your traditional, more recent uh, corporate venture capital sort of approach? Uh, first of all, as, as, I, I, as I pointed out, uh, most corporations have kind of shot basic research that has eliminated it mm. from what they do. They mm-hmm. no longer do that anymore. Yeah. Um, two is uh, most applied um, research, that is innovation at speed, is, well, companies are good at defending their core business, but innovation on, on disruption and things they haven't even thought about is actually being funded en masse by startups and venture capital. Mm. Um, and for companies to keep their finger on the pulse of what's going on, it's almost impossible to do that by sitting in your shiny office yeah. with your great view in your window in Melbourne or Sydney or mm. even in New York when the activity is occurring in Herzler or Shanghai or, you know, San Francisco or Silicon Valley. Yeah. And, and so... The first step that companies do is they kind of set up a an office here or wherever the action is, um, and they staff it with business development people. That is, people whose job it simply is is to network and get to know companies and what's going on and what are they building, etc. Mm-hmm. And then the next step in an innovation outpost is if that's of interest and they go, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff. We need to own some of it. The next type of people they send out are venture, corporate venture capital people. So now mm. you have the biz dev people, and then you have corporate venture capital. Mm. And then the third part is, if, if it's really of interest, and let's say you're an automotive manufacturer, and you realize autonomous vehicles are going to be critical to your success in 10 years or sooner, and that Silicon Valley or other places have great expertise in machine, in machine vision and then, you know, 
autonomous uh, machine intelligence, you might want to actually start a R&D group out here that's right. not just, you know, playing games, but actually making a real product that actually is de- de- delivering capabilities that your core organization that might be working on engines and transmissions and mechanical stuff just has mm-hmm. no expertise in or doesn't have the time and bandwidth to do. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's kind of the rationale for an innovation outpost. Mm, um, there is a, a bigger picture going on, if I can, about mm-hmm. innovation in companies. Can I, can I offer you and your listeners a framework a bit? Sure, sure. Go ahead, Steve. About so about 20 or 30 years ago, some really smart guys at uh, McKinsey came up with this idea that said, look, if you want to think about innovation in a corporation, mm-hmm. it's kind of easier to think about it as occurring in three buckets, yeah. as three horizons, they call them. Mm-hmm. That is, think about your core business. And in 21st century parlance, we would say, think about your core business model as, as, as horizon one innovation. Mm-hmm. This is what we do to stay in business. This is what makes us money. We know our customers. We know our channel. We know our competitors. We know mm-hmm. supply chain. We know everything about this business. And by the way, every once in a while, we're pretty good at extending our business model. Mm. Maybe we go after a different customer segment with the same product, or maybe we use a different channel, or maybe we know the customer so well, like Procter & Gamble, we create entirely new products with our existing manufacturing resources mm-hmm. and create you know, a new mop or a new whatever. Those are all called Horizon 2 innovation, meaning You've, you've taken your core business, but you've extended the business model in very interesting ways, which gets you new revenue, new customers, extends the life of the company, etc. Yeah. Not just product line extensions, but, but maybe new innovation. Mm-hmm. But what corporations are really bad at in general, not because they're dumb, just because it's incredibly hard, mm-hmm. is what McKinsey called Horizon 3 innovation. It's what Clinton Christensen calls disruptive innovation. Correct. This is like... Apple computer becoming Apple music and then Apple, the phone company, mm. Whoa. or Amazon, the book, or the place you went to buy books now is in fact, Amazon web services, Correct. which, you know, powers every startup in the world. It's uh, computing is now a utility mm. or just the Amazon and maybe a few others or Netflix where at least in the U S used to get DVDs by mail and yeah. now you stream video. That's right. Um, those are companies that have figured out how to disrupt themselves. Mm. Um, and, and in fact, there are a few companies that, that have done it for tens of almost 100 years. And the U.S. General Electric is the model of a company that's historically continued mm. to reinvent itself almost every decade by getting in and out of major uh, business segments. But, mm. but the key idea is why companies don't last very long on average is that they tend to focus on horizon one and sometimes horizon two, Correct. but get disrupted by startups and new entrants yeah. or not reading from the same playbook and are horizon three disruptors. Mm. The problem is, is of course, corporations are run almost always by horizon one executives Correct. who have a very hard time dealing with innovation and even a harder time understanding that the culture of innovation, the incentives of innovation, the KPIs of innovation, how you staff, how you build a horizon three and disruptive groups and how you manage them as a portfolio mm-hmm. are radically different on how you manage and incent and build horizon one and two organizations. Mm. Did any of this make sense? And yeah. what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you actually answered about four or five of my questions there, Steve, so thanks for that. But um, ultimately, uh, the question was around uh, processes, systems, values, um, and I think using the three horizons model makes sense um, to discuss this point. I think a lot of organizations who are exploring innovation, well, I don't think, I mean, it seems to be quite obvious. You've talked about the fact that large organizations are built to execute upon a repeatable business model while startups exist. Yeah, ex- startups exist to find a, rep- a repeatable business model. And it's as if large companies try and use the processes, systems, people that are put in place for H1. Um, to explore H3, and that simply doesn't really work. And, and they're surprised. And in fact, you, why I, to be honest, and your listeners could be the first to kind of know this, why I've kind of gotten drug into dealing with corporate innovation, not just startups, mm. is, is that I've been watching now large companies try to apply lean startup methodologies, going, well, it works for startups. Why don't we do a, you know, uh, 
an incubator in the corporation and why don't we have nice shiny posters and coffee cups and yeah. why don't we you know whatever and, and then of course you kind of look at it and I kind of just roll my eyes because you know what the answer is if you'll go back three years from now and they'll say so did you move the needle in like profits or mm. revenue or mm. you know is there any kind of well look at our posters <laughs> or gee we got some nice t-shirts out of this or or look at all the press releases well, about at, our incubator. Yeah, look at all and, the And the answer guys. is, well, <laughs> that's just innovation theater. Mm. Um, it's it's the same like in large companies who have advanced corporate R&D groups. I mean, mm -hmm. there are people who still do corporate R&D. The mm -hmm. problem is, is, is if you really step back, most of that corporate R&D really is around Horizon 1 and 2 innovation mm -hmm. because there's no physical way you could have Horizon 3 people sitting in the same building. Uh, it literally, you cannot have them coexisting uh, with the same, you know, incentive programs, the same culture, the same KPIs. Mm. Horizon 3 people are crazy. I mean, it's what defines a startup. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you can't do this in a corporation, but you really need to understand how to engineer an innovation culture and an innovation incentives and an innovation portfolio. It's not just one discrete activity and it's not just the memo from the managing directors or board and, and executive staff that make this happen it's yeah. a lot of work it yeah. involves you know a lot of moving parts and um and, and by the way the the bad news is if you're a shareholder mm -hmm. the system is kind of gamed for this to fail um and, and not that anybody is doing it on purpose but avarice and greed for uh, short-term profits tend to kind of diminish the incentives for CEOs and for corporations to make long-term bets in innovation. Yeah. Because every uh, chess piece you move about starting an innovation program or starting you know, some of these activities uh, automatically diminishes your horizon one revenue or, or at least profits. Mm. Now, the good news is, is that the mistake most people make is thinking that these disruptive innovations have to cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars or billion dollar acquisitions. That's just the fundamental flaw in the thinking. Mm. No, they're not. These lean startup bets are actually small, small bets that small are bets. just mm. placed wi wisely, not mm. huge bets that are, 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 are just placed incorrectly. incorrectly yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think you touched on quite a few interesting points there, one of which was innovation theater, where we have corporate executives standing up in front of a few hundred employees and saying, go go out, be bold, be innovative, um, but not really providing any sort of roadmap to do that, not really rethinking the systems, the policies, processes, values of their organization to actually support you know, being innovative. We see companies run hackathons, which say, hey, let's bring together people for three days and let them build stuff, but there's absolutely no... Uh, they're not conscious of the business model um, of you know taking that lean startup philosophy and, and taking lots of small bets throughout that process to validate some of those assumptions. They, if if they choose to take an idea further, it's always based on you know NPV. What's the NPV? How big is the market? Um, and generally, ideas that are going to generate sort of the short-term re returns that you alluded to won't get uh, won't see light of day. And if they do, usually they're pulled early because they're just not generating those returns that corporate executives want to see. And, and, and I'll even double down on, on that. I think mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. And, and here's, here's the remote diagnostic I now do is that when I get called going, oh, or, you know, incubators and doing well. And, you know, I almost know that the, that, the, that the symptom is just the symptom because the mm -hmm. question I almost always ask is, so help me understand how do the operating divisions uh, interact with the incubator? Mm. And the answer almost always, not always, but almost always is, oh, we're still working on that. Yeah. Well, no, you didn't do the hard stuff first. You did the easy stuff. Mm. Any idiot could set up a corporate incubator. Yeah. But the real work is to trying to figure out is how does it add value to the corporation? And, and like, when do the operating divisions say, we'll take the output of this, or mm. here's the metrics, or here are the innovation KPIs when we'll do incremental funding of these things, or mm. here's when it gets large enough that we'll agree it, it stands up as its own division, or, or gee, no, we've already kind of pre-computed. This is, in fact, when we'll spin it out. I mean, if you haven't had those conversations, then of course it's going to be theater. What are you surprised about? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so usually by the time I get those phone calls, it's, it's 
way too late <laughs> because you've just been kind of shunted off into a staff function. Mm. Not really good designed to do anything other than generate great press releases for the company that says, see, we're, we're being innovative as well. That's and, right. And that's usually, a, that's, in fact, that's the time I want to short the stock. Mm. Yeah, we, we, it's, it's funny. Uh, you know, we see a lot of um, idea contests with, within large companies where they say, hey, we're running this innovation program, submit your ideas. And there's absolutely no uh, guidance provided around whether these ideas are H1, H2, H3. Um, the, and the, 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 the criteria that ideas are basically selected on are, again, H1 criteria. And so you only ever have small, safe innovations that are, that are selected in, in, through those programs that are incremental and won't really help companies catch that next S-curve. But they make organizations feel like, hey, we're being innovative, we're, we're getting ideas from people, look, and look at our press release, you know, we're doing the right thing. That's right. Mm. And, 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 you know, if you double down on that, the, the problem for innovation in large corporations are it's not that the sometimes the top doesn't get it. You know, the exec staff goes, okay, we bought into it. And the, the, the innovators in the bottom of the organization are cheering, going, yeah, there's a program for us. Mm. But it kind of dies in the middle. You know, it dies, I, I kind of call it the, the roadblock in the middle. And, and most of the time it's not people trying to do bad. It's, mm. Sometimes there is, and we'll just talk about that in a second, but number one is, you know, the people in the middle of the organization going, okay, I saw the poster and I saw we're being innovative, but <laughs> you didn't change my job spec. Correct. You didn't change my incentives. That's right. You didn't change my organization. Mm -hmm. And now you're asking me to support something and I, all I saw was some memo. Correct. You know what? I'll just kind of ignore this and much like other stuff, it'll just go away. Yeah. And boom, innovation kind of dies. Mm -hmm. There's another way innovation dies inside, is, mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, sometimes it is kind of important, but it's a threat to an existing organization. And so if your career has been measured by power, by people, by budget, and whatever, and this stuff is not in your bailiwick or it changes your organization or whatever, you'll actively sabotage or kill it. Because it's not what you've been doing, and nor, nor, not only are you not going to get bonus for it or not incentive for it, it's a negative incentive. It's now your job is either harder or, mm -hmm. or your authority has been diminished, and you'll fight it. Um, and, and so what I find is, is that companies do, and, and G is, an, is a counterexample with mm -hmm. their, the work Eric Reese has done with them, but most companies just kind of stop at the memo rather than figuring out, no, we need to get HR involved change specs and change incentives and change whatever. And in fact, my other remote diagnostic to this about whether the exec staff is serious, whether a corporation is serious about mm -hmm. innovation and, and, and being able to keep up with the changes is the first thing I ask is, so help me understand how the incentive program for the exec staff has changed. Mm. And if the answer is silence, yeah. then you go, well, okay, well, Give me a call back when you guys are committed, not when you want to like write some more memos. Correct. Um, and, and what I mean by that, it doesn't mean that you won't want a hundred percent of now everybody looking at in innovation. That's also a going out of business strategy. Mm. But you want some percentage of incentives aligned. You know, most employees are coin operators, and I don't mean that in a it's a pejorative. But you you align incentives with the behavior you want. Mm -hmm. And if you're not changing any of that behavior or incenting any new behavior, then why are you surprised? Yeah, exactly. The corporation is going, well, well that's nice. You know, <laughs> but, you know, did, did this change anything I need to do? No. Did it change my salary? No. Does it change my butt? No. Mm -hmm. Does it change any key performance indicator I measure? No. 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 Okay. And, and so you know, people are surprised. By the way, why that's different in a startup in a startup, 100% of your company is aligned around Horizon 3 disruption innovation because, mm. like, mm. you're going out of business unless you figure out how to, how to find product market fit. In exactly. a large company, you've already found product market fit, and therefore your job is simply execution of a known business model. Mm. Where, and so, it, so the incentives are, are different in, between large companies and startups. In a, in a startup, speed is of, of, of essence because... Mm. You don't have time to get it perfect. You just have time to get it out, to get enough customers to survive. Mm. And, and so the incentives are kind of inverted between large companies and startups. That's why you need these new Horizon 3 groups 
to be separate with their own unique KPIs Correct. until they or key performance indicators until they get to product market fit and scale. And then eventually you either stand them up as their own divisions or you integrate them back in to the horizon one. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense because you know, you talk about H one to H three and you know, in a corporate environment, a typical H1 environment, you've got your reasonably fat paycheck. Um, you work reasonably short hours compared to what those of us in the startup world work. And the incentive, the, the hunger is not quite the same as a startup who maybe has $100,000 in the bank, five mouths to feed. And, you know, operating under lean startup, the speed is absolutely fundamental to success. Every dollar is allocated in a way that you're going to get some learning from that um, and you're not simply going to go out and say, okay, this is the strategy. Here's our 100-page business case. Um, we're going to execute on this for the next nine months and hope for the best. Yep. Yep. So, and, and, and so, yeah, it's an interesting problem. It is. And, and by the way, it's just getting harder. You know, the, in the 20th century, uh, there was a, a CEO of G named Jack Welsh who mm. kind of had some of the, you know, the uh, a set of euphemisms and rules of thumb that he used to kind of manage GE. And, and by the way, what I remind my students is they were brilliant in the 20th century. But mm -hmm. if you're a corporate CEO and you're executing Jack Wells rules 21st, you're going to put your company out of business in five years. Correct. Not because Jack Walsh was an idiot. Jack Walsh was a genius. Mm -hmm. But the world around you has changed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I can't think of a single industry where it hasn't changed whether it's mining in Australia or, you know, yeah. oil extraction or biotech or, or mm -hmm. certainly software. In my lifetime as an entrepreneur, just I'll give you one example. The price of doing a software startup has plummeted by a factor of a thousand. Yeah. One thousand. Yep. You know, it used to cost $4 million to do a software startup because you needed to buy a mini computer called a Max mm -hmm. for a million dollars. You needed to buy software to run on another million dollars because you used waterfall engineering that would mm -hmm. take you you know, two years to ship something, that's another million bucks, and because you were always late, so let's throw in another million dollars. It's four million dollars. Today, you know, students on a laptop plugging into Amazon Web Services using, you know, Google Store or, or, or Apple's App Store can be deploying software in weeks or months for 4,000 bucks, or, you mm -hmm. know, if, if you really had a lot of money, a hundred grand. Uh, and it's just unbelievable and every mm -hmm. other industry is kind of seeing the same change and if you think it's not if it's just software tech you know look at Exxon they almost lost their leadership in the 20th century because they used to believe oil and production was you drilled vertical holes in the ground and pumped out stuff that was underneath and in fracking that is mm -hmm. you know hydraulic fracturing with horizontal drilling two very different technologies that intersected allowed people in the United States to hit shale plays that thought were unreachable and untouchable mm. and dramatically stood the entire oil industry on its head, made the U.S. the number one oil producer in less than five years. Correct. Um, and, and so I can't think of a single industry that is, hasn't been disrupted and, and, or isn't because of a combination of these things. Mm. And so, but the, but the other funny thing is, you know, if you've gotten, if you're a, a, a manager, a world-class manager, and you've got your... MBA, your master's of business administration degree, you know, more than five years ago, yeah. it's obsolete. Yeah. If you're thinking about innovation, not, mm -hmm. again, not that anybody was stupid or the curriculum was wrong or whatever. The world has changed so rapidly. Right. The things that you're reading and teaching, which were actually good ideas then, are no longer good ideas. Um, and in fact, might actually, be, as I said, put you out of business. Mm. Yeah, and I guess the lesson learned there for executives at companies who consider themselves in an industry which is very capital intensive is just because it's capital intensive today and the barriers to entry are high today doesn't mean that they will be 5, 10, or 20 years from now. Yep, and, and, and so there are some industries, you know, that manage to uh, uh, own their businesses regardless of the onslaughts of new industries because they kind of game regulation or they mm -hmm. corrupt political processes or, yeah. uh, or, you know, or they have copyrights or they use the law to kind of stifle innovation. Um, and, and for some industries that works just fine, uh, but it's not particularly good for that country or that, in, for that industry or, or individuals, but mm. there are people who play that game. And in fact, uh, you know, it's very interesting. You could almost map the amount of innovation by country mm -hmm. 
is inversely proportional to the amount of corruption in that country. Yeah. Because the incumbents tend to strangle innovation in their crib. Mm. The other interesting thing is that Horizon 3 innovation, not copy innovation or, or adapting someone else's business model, but Steve Jobs or Elon Musk innovation is directly proportional to how countries treat their dissident artists. Mm. If you, that is, if you put artists in jail, you're going to put founders in jail. And if not physically, at least mentally. World-class founders who create things that you and I have never thought about are closer to artists than any other domain. Mm. Meaning, there is no bounding box around their imagination. That's right. And the minute the state puts bounding boxes of, well, you can't attack a, you can't compete with a state-owned agency, or you can't compete with this company because the president's cousin owns that, or no, you're not well-connected here, or these are, quote, your new partners, mm. all of a sudden entrepreneurship becomes more of a safety game than a creative innovation game. Yeah. And, you know, the countries uh, like Australia and the U.S. and others where you could freely think about anything is where you'll get the most creative innovation. And sure. countries that kind of bounding box that stuff, you'll get, you know, great companies that, that fulfill current needs, but um, probably not as innovative. And I yeah. think that's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, definitely. And we're seeing... As companies go global. Mm, definitely. And I guess you, you look at Uber and all the um, troubles they've had to deal with from a regula regulatory perspective over the last few years. And if you go back to the start of the 20th century when... You know, the Model T Ford came along and initially wasn't allowed to drive faster than horse-drawn carriages in order to protect the incumbent industry at the time. Yep. Mm. Yep. I, uh, I think that's true. And in the U.S., we're going through that with Tesla and car dealerships. And, mm -hmm. you know, the movie industry is always in the U.S. Uh, uh, historically have uh, fought on copyrights and legal protections rather than on continual innovation in terms of devices. I mean... In the U.S., the movie industry uh, fought uh, videotapes, and then mm -hmm. they fought DVDs, and then they fought, you know, digital distribution. And, of course, in hindsight, each one of them added significant revenue to the industry, but yeah. it was over their dead body when they kind of drug into the next technology. Uh, Correct. Uh, Correct. Uh, and I just find that kind of interesting. And, again, to go look at countries where, uh, where corruption is endemic, uh, mm -hmm. you find, you know, entrepreneurs fleeing. Mm -hmm. uh, those environments, or you know, the cost of starting a company to be onerous, or taxes on on, on profits of new ventures. Um, you could certainly find lots of ways to engineer innovation outside out of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, and I point that out just to, to make the same analogy with inside a corporation. You know, if you're a CFO and HR people say these are the rules, everybody will follow these rules. I don't mm -hmm. care what project you're working on. Yeah. Um, you're innovative people are going to read those rules and go, that's great, we're leaving. Yeah. And, and you're going to be a rise one company and do just fine for 10 or 15 years, but you know, hopefully you're updating your resume or retired because you've just put your company out of business in the long term. Yeah, and no, that makes sense. And, and that, I guess that just, I draw parallels between that and just the underlying concept of creativity. You know, if you start with too many constraints, then there's only so creative you can actually be. Whereas if you embrace Anything being possible, you're going to you're going to come out with a lot more different sort of types of innovations or at least ideas. Yes. Mm. Um, yes. So you touched earlier on the the fact that not 100% of your organization need to be crazy entrepreneurs. I think, as you correctly mentioned, that would be the death of the company. Um, and you've talked about this concept of getting to yes for corporate innovation. So, putting the corporate innovation outburst aside for a second, this is more so about how do we redesign some of those internal policies that prevent innovation? For example, do we only allocate capital into projects where the market size is large enough to support our growth targets being achieved? Um, which obviously means that disruptive innovation where the market is small or insignificant won't be supported. Um, obviously, we're not saying we redesign the existing processes because that would they're, they're, they're there for a reason, they're there to support the status quo. Um, can you talk to us about this concept of getting to yes for corporate innovation and of developing parallel policies? Sure. So, you, you know, let's start all the way on the top. I mm -hmm. think you, you mentioned it, and let's just review is if you think of innovation occurring across three horizons, and again, you know, if you're a corporate exec, find some other metaphor. This one, for me, kind of works because it kind of simplifies how you how you think about allocating all this stuff. So number one is, 
you want to allocate R&D across horizons. Mm -hmm. Most companies, again, yours might vary, you know, you pour about 60 to 70% of your R&D money into Horizon 1, mm -hmm. somewhere between 10 and 20% in extending Horizon 1 into Horizon 2, and then you save kind of 5 to 10% of your budget for Horizon 3. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting right there. Um, so you need to be asking, what is the, you know, portfolio allocation of dollars mm. across the horizons uh, on the top line. The second thing you need to think of, and, and this came, uh, as you mentioned, I'm working with Evangelist and Moody's, and his insight was, well, that's nice, but you also ought to be figuring out what's the ROI return in terms of years mm. for investment in each one of those horizons. That is, if you're saying, great, no, no, we're going to double our horizon three investment, and expect something to come out next year, yeah. you're pretty confused. Yeah. Because unless you're buying a company, internal investments, you know, Horizon 3 innovations, usually don't show up for four to 10 years mm. from the time you start funding them. Correct. Much like startups. I mean, they're internal startups, and maybe you could accelerate some of them, but it's not going to affect your bottom line rapidly. Mm. But Horizon 2 innovations might, you know, kind of occur. Yeah, you could imagine somewhere between two and five years if you start investing now about extending new channels or, you know, new product lines. Mm. Of course, investment in Horizon 1, you have existing channels, you have existing customers, you get those new products out there, now you'll start seeing revenue in the next quarter. Mm. So, number one is thinking about how you're allocating money, but number two is you ought to always keep in mind, at least for internal R&D efforts, when do you see the results? Well, those results vary depending on the horizons. Mm -hmm. Again, you could shortcut by acquisition, which is why you see companies doing those bets, mm -hmm. but that needs to be part of this discussion. Now, back to your question about getting to yes, it's a pretty interesting phenomenon because if you spin out these, or spin up these Horizon 3 efforts internally, yeah. kind of instead of in, uh, uh, innovation outposts, think of them as innovation inposts, that is, internal innovation efforts, um, you know, typically you get into this us versus them philosophy is, you know, okay, you, you you have a separate building, a separate group, but you know, mm -hmm. finance is like saying you still need to fill out the expense reports exactly like the large company, and they're saying, how come you don't have any revenue this year? And Great. HR is saying, no, you can't hire the, you can't take the most creative people. You need to take people by seniority. And mm -hmm. by the way, these are all real things I've encountered working with a large company. <laughs> so, and you kind of go, I don't think you guys understand. And the answer is, no, they don't. That's so, right. so what I've found is on. Rule one is you need to assign people from the support organizations that already exist, not create your own, but assign mm -hmm. people on temporary duty to these Horizon 3 organizations. And their job is to get that organization to yes, yes. not to no. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say no, but that's no longer their job. In fact, their incentives have changed. Their job is to get to yes. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, um, and... Uh, their job is to get the yes, and their job is, is to figure out how to use the core organization to do that. Mm -hmm. the, the, other, the other piece of this is that, um, you know, usually when you start a new with in, in companies who haven't had this Horizon 3 model, they pull out the HR handbook, for example, and say, <laughs> well, there isn't, you know, there isn't anything in here that says how we're supposed to handle this. And, and the reason why you kind of have temporary duty people getting the yes is they say, well, Here's the new section of the handbook. Mm. You have a week to either approve this, or we escalate it to you know a higher level. That's gonna, gonna you're gonna have to say why you can't say yes to this new handbook. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, Meaning makes... you're actually writing the new processes as mm. needed. Yeah, and it's it's critical that we write new processes to support innovation and not rewrite the existing ones, which are there for a, for a purpose. Well, yes, though, again, I'll, I'll raise the flag. This is not a blank check to do anything you want that mm. might be destructive. The first test of any new process is, is it going to kill Horizon 1 revenue, you know, now or in the future? Mm. And if so, it, it doesn't kill the, the, the process. It just now asks us the question, that is the trade-off worthwhile? Okay. That's, that's a very different answer, right? right. It's not... That doesn't veto the process. That just kind of gets us. And if the answer is no, it doesn't affect the rise of one, then great. We have a new process. Yep. Um, and, 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 and again, some people go, no, 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 no. It's <laughs> not what we're doing. And you go, no, you don't understand. We're running. And again, this is a, a phrase from people at Stanford and MIT or Riley and Pressman. 
we're running an, an, what they call an ambidextrous organization, mm-hmm. an organization that could do both execution of core business mm-hmm. while creating new in, in, innovation initiatives. That's right. The, what I've been talking about is not new ideas. People have been talking about this for decades. So let me be clear. This is not new stuff. Mm. Well, what's new are two things. One is, this is now not just nice to know. This is now turned into survival techniques mm. for companies. Where before it was nice to know, because yeah, we got years, maybe decades to worry about this. Now it's like, holy cow. Two mm. is, and this is why, as I said, why I got involved, even that we had the theory, we didn't know what the practice was. That is, there wasn't any lean anything that we could point to that says, well, this is how startups are doing. Maybe we should adapt and adopt some of this stuff. Yeah. And, and that's what's different as well. We can now say, well, we know how startups move at speed, and more importantly, we know the theory and methodology behind how they move at speed. How do we adapt and adopt that to our culture and our needs? Mm. That's what's new in the 21st century. Right, and, and there is no silver bullet, and I think one of the only ways you're going to identify which policies need uh, a, a parallel policy, which processes need to change, which systems are inhibiting our ability to move as fast as a startup does, is by sitting down and actually perhaps trying to run an innovation sprint and seeing where the roadblocks are. Yes, yes, I couldn't agree more. Mm, interesting. Um, so. On the topic of um, culture, um, I know GE, you know, as you correctly alluded to, they're one of these organizations that's constantly evolved. Um, Eric Rees and David Kidder spent a bit of time uh, training up, I believe, over a thousand middle managers um, in the Lean Startup yep. methodology. Um, but what they found, what those middle managers found when they went back to their organizations was that the underlying culture, um, as we've been discussing, didn't really support um, the the implementation of lean startup, the, you know, the whole concept of experimentation, failing fast, taking lots of small bets. Um, the culture is critical to supporting any type of innovation activity. I mean, have you got any thoughts on on changing some of those entrenched values within a company to support innovation? Sure. And, and, and I didn't know that happened at GE, but it happened at a. Um, it's very funny, and uh, because I was going to tell you a story of how exactly that happened in a large <laughs> Japanese company, mm-hmm. who I won't mention whose name starts with an S, um, <laughs> who had the exact same experience. They're like, okay, we trained them up, and, and now we got this program going, and we wanted the middle-level managers to kind of vet or, or nominate their most innovative people to kind of join this program. Mm. And no one was doing that. And the reason why is, of course, you kind of deconstructed this and in a very Japanese way is like, what's in it for me? What would I want to let my best people go? Mm-hmm. And, and you kept saying, well, this is a, you know, the president of the company, you know, wants to, well, nothing moved this thing until we actually got one middle level manager kind of we twisted his arm and got him drunk and whatever and got him to volunteer one of his people to do this we would support. And what we did was we got him a letter mm-hmm. from the president of the company. We're in Japan. That's like a big deal. Yeah. Thanking him personally that, you know, for helping the company move forward, blah, 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 you know, fancy words and, <laughs> and like whatever. This became a shrine. I wow. mean, people would, his peers came over to him. He was like, his chest was like six feet wide. He was puffing around. Got, and all of a sudden, the dam broke. Meaning, all of a sudden, all the other middle-level managers wanted a letter from the president. Mm-hmm. Now, nothing changed other than they understood that this was a big deal that was acknowledged. You know, and what we call this was an, an example, because we had to fight these fires on multiple levels, mm-hmm. hacking the culture. Yeah. I mean, we literally had to hack the culture. And every time we would do that, we would ask, are we going to diminish our ability to execute our current mission? meaning our core Horizon 1. No. Mm-hmm. And remember, we didn't want 20 of the, their people leaving. We wanted just one. Yeah. And no, these were reasonable tests, but we needed to break the culture. And mm-hmm. so I think the example of GE is an example of, yes, every time you find one of those obstacles, instead of going to fail, you go, ah, we missed that one. We need to hack our own culture. So what do we need to do to do that? In GE's case, if I had heard this, I would have said, Okay, well, clearly the people, you know, are going back at an organization that didn't have an incentive program to support them. Yeah. What do we need to change in HR? What do we need to change in finance? What do we, how do we need to train and when and where and how? Um, so this is a continual process. It's not just, 
one big bang lets HR have some training. It's like, oh, which which other part of our system needs to kind of adapt and adopt to this? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense, and it's funny because I, you know, it reminds me of um, Stephen Kotler's book, Rise to, uh, sorry, The Rise of Superman which talks about high-performing individuals and how when they face obstruction, they get a second win and they find a way to overcome that obstruction and then they find another obstruction and then they they get, they get they catch their third win and they eventually um, do things that people don't think are uh, possible. And with most companies who try to create an innovation program, they find the first roadblock and they just say, okay, it's a failure, it doesn't work. Um, whereas companies like GE will find, okay, the culture doesn't work, what can we do to fix that? And eventually that hard work pays off in the long Term. And by the way, that is the culture of a startup, mm. right? A startup has its eyes on the prize, understanding that they will have a continual ser- a series of hypotheses, experiments, failures, you know, uh, validated and invalidated hypotheses right. and moving forward, you know, at rapid speed because they're just running full, full bore here. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and, and I think, uh, you know, tr- trying to put an innovation culture and process in place in a large company, we'll run into all these things. Mm. The other piece I, I want to mention is you know, GE was an anomaly because it had the support of Jeff Elmelt and Beth Comstock from the top down, um, you know, and, and decided to run this experiment on mass. Mm-hmm. Not every large company needs to start this thing by moving all the desks simultaneously. Correct. You could say, okay, I hear this stuff and great and you know, we started with a, a, a corporate incubator. Maybe that didn't work. What are the small experiments that we could prove to our operating divisions or us or the CEO that if we did this, this would kind of be good for us? What, what do we need to do? And, and my point is you could design a series of experiments that could, within the span of a year, rapidly mm. prove uh, uh, that this is worth doing. We've, we've done that at WL Gore, and Greg Hannon is in fact the core makes Cortex. Um, Greg Hannon and, and others run kind of the innovation culture there, and they mm-hmm. put you know teams of people through this now, gathering enough evidence to senior management that this is actually uh, this lean methodology is actually quite useful for spinning up new ideas in an incredibly short period of time mm. with a unbelievably small amount of money yeah. compared to traditional uh, uh, Horizon One products. Well, that's right, and I think on getting buy-in from senior executives, you know, that you, it's it's not hard to point to past projects that cost tens of millions of dollars and ultimately failed and say, well, if we had applied the Lean Startup philosophy, we would have identified that there was market failure much earlier in the piece. And I think GE actually found in their industrial business unit, they, were managed, to, they managed to bring down the cost of market validation by about 80%. Pretty amazing, huh? Mm. And, and that's what it's going to take to survive against the onslaughts of new entrants and startups and, you know, uh, new companies. Mm, definitely. Um, so I just wanted to quickly touch on government and public sector organizations. I know the National Science Foundation adopted your Lean Launchpad ca- uh, class and the Innovation Corps model, and more recently the Small Business Administration also adopted that the Innovation Corps. Um, can you just give me a high-level overview of working with government, some of the challenges you face, and how you managed to get them to uh, see the light in some <laughs> some way? Well, I think the, you know parts of government have to, coming to the same conclusions as corporations, and the sum is we can't go on like this. Mm. Um, and 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 if, and if parts have not come to that conclusion, mm. you can't help them yet. Uh, but for example, the National Science Foundation, which in the U.S. funds all basic uh, science in universities or everything but the life sciences, our National Institute of Health funds that. Mm-hmm. came to the conclusion about five years ago. Was, you know, the U.S. government mandated that uh, they save 3% of their budget for commercialization, and they've been trying to fund commercializing science for 30 years, and the results were horrifically bad. And someone finally said, it was a guy named Mara Arnold, who was mm-hmm. running commercialization, said, why are we still beating our head against the wall? This mm-hmm. isn't working. And so Errol found my stuff, my class at Stanford, which was teaching green methodologies to scientists and engineers, and we mm-hmm. ran a prototype and adopted it. And now all scientists in the U.S. want to get funding to commercialize their basic science research. That is to turn into companies have to go through some version of a lean startup class. They have to, you know, use the business model canvas, come up with hypotheses, get out of the 
their offices full of cow and talk to not just their peers, but the you know users and customers and regulators mm-hmm. and whatever, and then build minimum viable products and do all this in six weeks. Talk right. to over a hundred customers, partners, regulators, etc. Yeah, we put over eight hundred uh, scientists who who have never thought about customers through this process, not just to turn them into startups, but we've actually hacked them, meaning. Most of them aren't quitting their academic jobs. They're typically university professors, mm-hmm. but they're running labs of generations of graduate students who they now can teach what a commercialization activity is actually about, what starting a company is actually about, not just right. about having great science. It's about all these other moving parts they had no idea about. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and this came about, just to answer your question, because a part of the government said, we can't keep doing this. Mm-hmm. And this spread to the other, and by the way, in the U.S., this has happened, uh, we created, the, the, not we, but other people created the 18F, which is a digital services group for in our general services administration. There's lots of other digital services groups now. The U.S. has a chief technology officer mm-hmm. and a chief innovation officer from the government. Um, and we're adapting and adopting lean and agile methodologies. Um, again, not to replace, you know, massive amounts of of people, but to, to kind of accelerate innovation and, and adoption of technologies throughout the, the government. Mm, no, that makes perfect sense. And I think Gartner released a report that found that 70% of government IT projects tend to fail because they're overly complex. There's no real accountability and people are always um, you know, outsourcing decision making. And so projects take years, cost a lot of money and ultimately fail or don't deliver the benefits that they sought out to. And, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier with the prototyping and maybe getting senior executives engaged in some sort of a short sprint or even a hackathon or, and showing them what's possible. Yep. You know, getting If they go in there with one idea of what they think the solution is and then through a day of building prototypes and testing with actual customers or members of the public, they see that actually they're wrong, that may open their eyes. Yes, and that's incredibly, uh, incredibly useful. Mm. And, and by the way, for the government, the last thing we're doing here in the U.S. is uh, we're starting a new version of uh, uh, the class we did for the National Science Foundation, though this time for our Department of Defense and Intelligence community called Hacking for Defense. Mm-hmm. And we're, we've gone out to, to the our Department of Defense and military and asked for some of their toughest problems and are teaming students at Stanford uh, to kind of solve these problems in 10 weeks and not just prototypes and demos. Mm-hmm. They have more prototypes and demos they need to do with wow. uh, know what to do with, but actually, how do you get these to the hands of the people who need these solutions, Navy divers or Air Force people or Correct. cyber people? And how do you build solutions that will be used immediately? And that's an interesting uh, problem. Mm, definitely. Um, one of the final areas I wanted to touch on, Steve, was around acquisitions. Um, many companies believe that they can just keep up with disruption by acquiring uh, smaller organizations, but as is often the case, they acquire them pretty late in their life cycle when they've done a lot of their growing. Uh, they're paying a premium for these organizations, and oftentimes they try and integrate them into the mothership, which ultimately stunts their um, growth. Um, what's your opinion on acquisitions as a shield to disruption? Well, you know, um, it, it's really interesting. I, I was on multiple sides of this on boards of public companies that mm-hmm. did, you know, acquisitions. I've been on boards of startups that get, got acquired and realized that there, there really is a different way to think about if you're a corporate acquirer, how and when you should be acquiring. So for example, if a company hasn't even started talking to customers and doesn't even have a product out, then maybe you're just doing a, what used to be called, they're still called an aqua hire. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're acquiring just for the, the team. Correct. And if that's the case, then just integrate them completely. Make mm-hmm. sure they understand and that they're that whatever compensation they're getting is completely tied to them staying because that's all you're acquiring. Mm -hmm. You're you're throwing out the rest of the the product strategy. But the next uh, uh, phase a company could be in is, no, they're well into product development and they're out searching for product market fit. Mm -hmm. This is a big idea. If they don't have a, a, a repeatable and scalable revenue stream yet, but they're building product and looking for product market fit, the worst possible thing an acquirer could do is try to integrate them. That's right. Why? Because it's this culture of searching requires shortcuts and 
and, and gee, there's a ton of technical debt. You don't really want to look under the hood here. And even more so, there's a ton of organizational debt, which right mm-hmm. now is good. These are the people you want to be searching for a business model. You want them to be creating, mm-hmm. you know, a little chaos and conflict in the marketplace. And you do not want them to have to deal with now at the same time they're trying to do that. All your organizational baggage, which works for Horizon One, will crush them and will kill that search. Does that make sense? So yeah, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, there's no shortage of... And, 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 and let me just go go down to the ne- mm-hmm. next phase. But there are some startups that have now grown into, no, no, we have real revenue. We have a sales force. We have revenue stream. It's predictable. And in that phase, a acquirer can say, huh, what if, in fact, we actually gave this product not only to their sales force but our channel? Mm. And, and would that, in fact, accelerate growth without screwing up, you know, the would this be, you know, uh, additive to our revenue and profits? Well, if that's the case, then you, again, now want to go the opposite way and say, no, we don't want it standalone. We truly do want to integrate this stuff because it is our value add that Mm -hmm. will make it grow. Yeah, Yeah, it makes perfect sense. You know, and uh, on acquiring and integrating when it's probably best to leave them on their own, you know, there's no shortage of organizations who say spend $5 million buying a company and then five million integrating them and taking their systems and putting them onto their legacy infrastructure and before you know it the founders of that acquired company just can't stand working in a bureaucratic environment end up leaving and then the vault that the, the parent company has ultimately paid about ten million dollars for something that has no real value or isn't going to do too much more growing so it's an interesting dilemma and, and my point is is that there never was a heuristic that mm. says are they searching or executing? Correct. If they're searching, great, that's wonderful, but don't overlay your organization. That's when they need to stand alone mm-hmm. until they have found a repeatable model. Give them essentially a corporate concierge so they could get some access to some of the things you need, but specifically keep your HR and finance people away from them. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, do not uh, uh, kind of try to integrate that. But when it has a repeatable model and there is scalable sales, then the opposite is true. Then uh, you want to take the best of that and, and see if you can actually, you know, use whatever leverage you have in the marketplace to 10x or 100x mm-hmm. uh, that type of rep. Yeah, that's right. And that's, uh, I guess, the, the foundation of a corporate startup partnership where you have a startup who has, you know, can move quickly, can can move at that speed that's fundamental to success as a startup, but you have access to the domain expertise and perhaps the scalability of a large organization as well and access to their networks for the purposes of customer validation too. So it can be quite a quite a beautiful marriage between a startup and a corporate working together in that capacity. Um, just wanted to wrap up with a bit of fun, Steve. So basically I ask all of my guests two hypotheticals and one question on lifestyle. So the first one is, and I know this is completely unrehearsed, so just say the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, if you could work for any company at any stage of their life cycle, who would it be and why? Gee, that's a tough one. It is. Um, <laughs> you know, I guess I would have loved to work at, can we t- talk about past companies? Or yeah, companies? A- any company. You know, I guess I would have loved to work at uh, Apple on day one. Oh, um, yep. Uh, you know, I guess I, I would have loved to have been at, uh, um, not Ford, but uh, General Motors um, mm-hmm. uh, in, when it was run by an entrepreneur, not when, uh, not in the 20s, but in the early 1900s, mm-hmm. um, when a very crazy founder uh, uh, ran it. Um, I think those are the two places I think might have been interesting. Yeah, no, great answers. Um, and number two, if you could ask anybody dead or alive a question, who would it be and what would you ask them? Gee, um, that's a that's a good question. I I've never thought of that one. Um, dead or alive, you know. Um, you know, I think I might uh, tend to, to get into the sacrilegious uh, here, so I, mm-hmm. I think I'll skip this. But around Christmas, you can imagine who I might want to ask a question. To. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and finally, I guess I'm. Keen on getting inside the heads of people who I consider high performers and have achieved a lot in their lifetime. Um, keen to find out what you do to stay on top of your game and keep contributing the way you are. So that's a great question. And, and um, 
and I'm not going to talk about me, but I'm just going to talk about in general. Mm -hmm. I have found actually uh, uh, people who are on top of their game are just by brain chemistry perpetually curious mm -hmm. about a lot of things, right. about a lot of stuff. Um, you know, we talk about resilience, we talk about agility, we talk about all the tactical things that make entrepreneurs go through walls. But I think that the thing that makes them great and different is that they're curious about more than just what you would think their domain is. Um, mm. And they're perpetually curious, um, and, and it doesn't stop. And, and I think I would, and, and then the other thing is they're also brain, this is just brain chemistry, I'm not sure how you get it, that they're always running a neural net for pattern recognition between those domains mm -hmm. that might seem like they're disconnected. Mm. But they're also always wondering if there are parallels and, and whether there are signals and noise. And that's how I would actually describe my career is that mm -hmm. I was curious about a lot of stuff and, um, and I was always running pattern recognition in the back of my head, mm. trying to suck in as much data as I could. And maybe the third is, and, and again, I'll say me, but, but I see it in all world-class entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. not that I was, but, but is that you're not afraid, I guess the phrase is to speak truth to power. You you don't really care what the status quo is. It doesn't matter because you don't care. It's, you know, thank you, but I don't believe the world works this way. I mean, the Lean Startup started when I was the total available market of one. And when I convinced Eric Ries it was a good idea, mm -hmm. I doubled the market size. But let me tell you, the pretty lonely place to be is telling everybody we're building startups and, and teaching <laughs> entrepreneurship the wrong way. Yeah. If you cared a lot, you would not do that. And if you care... If you care what other people think, you're going to have a hard time being a founder. That's um, exactly right. Because a founder, by definition, is is an artist who who's creating something that doesn't exist before. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, and just like all famous artists, there's just a little bit of crazy inside. And sometimes not a little. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> that was a great answer, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, other than steveblank.com, is there anywhere else people can go to download some of your um, thought leadership? So uh, SteveBlank.com has a ton of material. If mm -hmm. you want to uh, look at everything you might need as an entrepreneur, there's a tab on top of SteveBlank.com called Startup Tools. Mm -hmm. Take a look at that. If you want to understand the secret history of Silicon Valley, take a look at that. If you want all of my course material, my students, uh, my lectures, um, uh, there's another tab called Slides and Video, mm -hmm. uh, and all of it's free. It's, I open source everything I do. and. Uh, and hopefully our listeners might get some use out of it. Beautiful. We'll, we'll add that to the show notes. So thank you again, Steve, for joining us. You've been an amazing guest. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. It was an absolute honor to have Steve Blank on the program. In the very near future, we'll also be bringing you Evangelos Moody's, who Steve Blank is working with on a model for corporate innovation. If you're picking up what we're putting down, I'd really appreciate if you spend just a minute to subscribe to Future Squared and like the program on either iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. If you have any questions about today's program, shoot them across to steve at collectivecamp.us. If you'd like a little bit more information about Future Squared, you can find that at futuresquared.xyz. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, you can do so at Steve Glaveski. That's G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I. And of course, for more information on Collective Campus, you can just head to www.collectivecamp.us. And before I forget, we've recently published the Innovation Manager's Handbook, which you can download absolutely free at www.collectivecamp.us theinnovationmanagershandbook.com. And with that, I bid you adieu. Future Squared out.